Welcome to South Point Church Online. Hi, I'm Matt. Hey, as we kick off December, I've discovered something about this month as we kick off the Christmas season. Now, what I've discovered about December is something that you might already know, and it's this. December will usually push most of us here today into one of two groups. Now, there's one group, and some of you are gonna go, that's me, and then there's another group, and you go, I don't know if that's me, but I'm probably more of that than the other. But here are the two groups that December will usually push you and me into. And the first one, I fall into this group, and it's right here, we're gonna put it on the screen. It's Buddy the Elf, right? I mean, some of us, like, when we think about December and Christmas season, we're like, woo, let's sing loudly for all to hear. We can't wait to put up decorations. In my case, I never take them down. My wife yells at me and says, hey, it's almost Easter, you should take down those Christmas uh, decorations like, I love Christmas. I love the lights. I love the presents. I love the food. I love hanging out. I love the celebrating. Like, I just follow that bracket of like, hey, when the Christmas season comes, it's my most favorite time of the year. Now, I get that some of us here are like that, but there's another group of people that the Christmas season, December, pushes you into, and we're going to put that up on the screen, and yep, it's the Grinch. Like, when Christmas season comes, you're like, nope, I'm not going to get excited. I just want this to be over. When Christmas is done, you go, Phew. I'm glad that's over. There's way too much craziness involved. I don't want to be a part of it. I just don't care. And so maybe if you're here today, what you want to do is you just want to type in the chat, maybe just type in uh, Elf or Grinch if you fall into that category. And listen, if you fall in the Grinch category, no worries. Like, I understand that happens to some people. But the reality is whatever group you fall into, whether it's the Elf or the Grinch, there's a truth about Christmas that we kind of know, we never really put into words, but all of us have absolutely experienced. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's this. The Christmas season often adds extra stress and craziness. I mean, right? Like we all get that, right? I mean, there's the extra stress and craziness of decorations. Like for me, I went down in my basement. And for you, it might be going up into your attic or wherever. But like you pull out the lights and some of them are broken and you're missing an extension cord and you go to the store to get a new light and it doesn't work. And then somebody says it's not lined up right. You put it all together like I did all the way up on my roof, but it didn't work. So I had to get a new thing and redo it. I mean, putting up decorations and trying to keep up with the Joneses and you see Pinterest and you see all your friends on Facebook and Insta, like all the pretty pictures. And you're like, that is way too much work. I mean, just the decorations can add stress and craziness. I mean, think about shopping. I mean, like that's a lot of money. We have kids and family and relatives. And in this season where some of us, maybe we didn't get to work the hours, maybe, maybe we were laid off due to the pandemic, our hearts go out to you. So like shopping for Christmas doesn't feel good. It feels stressful and, and it worries you and, and you feel overwhelmed. And when it comes to shopping, I mean, oh my gosh, what deal do you pick? And what if your kid wants the toy that's already sold out that you didn't know was going to be the hot thing? What happens if you don't get the right number of presents for each kid and they cry and they fight or someone gets your kid a gift, but you didn't get their kid a gift and like you have to have that spare one so when someone shows up like it's just stressful and crazy and we even got to like the cooking part right like all of us have favorite stuff at Christmas that we like to eat and everyone has different things and you hope not to burn the cookies and you're like well if my neighbor brings me cookies do I have to make them cookies I don't even like cookies why am I making them and then oh my gosh I haven't even added like the family part right because listen we all know this this is an old saying that says you can pick your friends but not your family I bet all of us can think of that one family member we love them but they're a little bit crazy. And when they show up for Christmas, it just adds to the stress and craziness. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. We've all experienced that the Christmas season often adds extra stress and craziness. Now, here's why this year it's doubly important. This year, this is doubly important for a reason that you've experienced. It's called 2020, and it reveals a truth that we all know, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. Sometimes the craziness of life is overwhelming. I mean, doesn't that describe 2020? I mean, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and we've all got pandemic fatigue, right? We've been in one of the most divisive election seasons ever. There's racial injustice and there's racial reconciliation that needs to happen and, and everyone's mad on Facebook and there's, there's all kind of rage quitting and like all this stuff, like just sometimes the craziness of life is overwhelming. I mean, that describes 2020, right? Murder hornets, right? And it can leave us depleted and weary. And it leads us to a truth for all of us. And listen, I get that some of you showed up today and, and you're kind of just curious and maybe checking out this Jesus thing. Others of you, like you didn't grow up with parents that taught you about Jesus. And some of you, you grew up to church and you've been following Jesus since you were a little kid, right? But the reality is, is all of us, 
are facing the start of the Christmas season, exhausted and weary. And we know that Christmas will just add stress and craziness. Now, whenever you and I experience the stress and the craziness that is added to Christmas season, we usually have two ways that we try to deal with this. And these are two tried and true ways that all of us, I know I've tried both of them, that most human beings try during the season. Unfortunately, they don't work as well as we hope. Now, here's the first way we tried to kind of do that. Here's what we do. We tried to manage the stress and the craziness of the Christmas season. And you probably know people like this, and you might even be that person, right? Like you have this master list of Christmas cards. You already did most of your Christmas shopping by Thanksgiving, right? You have a calendar. You have your maps timed out for all your family visits. And your goal is you have the exact number of presents for each kid so nobody gets mad. And your kind of idea to handle the stress and the craziness of this Christmas season is to try to manage it. But we all know, like, right, it just doesn't work. Here's why. Listen, if you got kids, you know this. doesn't matter how hard you try, there's going to be a meltdown. Somebody just type meltdown in the chat. Your kid at one point during the season is going to meltdown. There's going to be a Christmas present that doesn't arrive. There's going to be a Christmas card that doesn't get to where it's supposed to go. There's going to be a decoration or something that doesn't work that you hoped it worked. Some food is going to burn. Somebody's not going to be happy. Something it's not going to work out. Like, it's just the season. We can try to manage it all we want, but if we're really honest, trying to manage the craziness and the stress is really just futile. Now, there's a second way, and I've tried a combination of those, and you probably have too, and here's the second way. Or we try to medicate it. And I would say here in America, this is our favorite pastime, like medicating our lives, right? Like when it comes to medicating, like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take lots of time off and we're going we're gonna to consume some entertainment. We're going to consume some food. We're going to go onto Amazon and consume lots of things for ourselves, right? And, and we're just going to buy stuff and we're going to watch movies and we're going to eat food. And for some of us, we're going to drink way too much alcohol. And for others that struggle with addiction or illicit behaviors that harm ourselves and our families and others, we may step into this thing where we try to medicate that weariness and that tiredness. So we try to medicate it by feeling good. When we're really honest, that doesn't work either. All it does is create pain later down the road. If you're honest and I'm honest today, when we try to manage it or medicate it, it really just doesn't work. And I want to really be honest about the second one I'm going to put up on the screen, and it's this right here. Medicating our lives with consumption will not restore our soul. We can consume as much as we want and we can try to manage as much as we want, but it won't revitalize our heart and our soul. It just won't work on a weary soul. And it leaves you, it leaves me, it leaves all of us asking a really important question today that might be worth sticking around to answer. And here's the question that regardless of whether you have no faith or different faith, or you grew up in the faith, that all of us need as we start off this December in 2020, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen, and it's this. How do we find rest? How do we find rest for our weary souls in this Christmas season? If we're already starting Christmas off depleted and exhausted, how do we find rest and peace and joy as we kick off the season? Now, here's where I'm really fired up. Here's where I get excited. There's some really good news. Managing the stress and the craziness and medicating the stress and the craziness, those aren't our only two options. There's actually a third option that I get to share with you today. But to get to that third option, I have to undo kind of this like, this kind of like crazy comical thing that we get wrong about Christmas. It's kind of this air about Christmas that I know I've done and you've probably done. And when we look at it, you'll go, oh yeah, like I get that. And here's the comical air that we have to undo as we process it, and it's this. Christmas is about celebrating a rest, not creating stress. Maybe you wanna just take a little picture and put that on your Instagram. There you go, because listen, isn't that what Christmas is all about? Christmas is that in God's unconditional and unfailing love, he shows up in a busted and broken world and he fixes a problem that we created that we can't fix. You and I can't earn it and we can't work for it. 
the peace that God wants to have with us, the peace that God wants to give with ourselves, the peace that God wants us to have with each other doesn't come because we worked for it or we earned it or we're religious. No, it comes through the grace found in the sacrifice that Jesus made. Jesus was born to die and conquer hell and death so that we wouldn't have to work for it. It would be a free gift. Christmas celebrates a rest. It shouldn't be about creating a stress, but we often get it backwards, right? That happens. Now, whenever I talk about Christmas, I always need to kind of set some groundwork, and it's this, is that Christmas isn't a story. Today, as we talk about Christmas, I'm not going to use the word Christmas story because Christmas isn't a story that goes, oh, a long time ago in a land far away. That's not what Christmas is. Christmas is an historical event. You see, Christmas took place in a real historical city named Jerusalem. And this historical real place city, Jerusalem, existed in a real historical country that still exists today called Israel. And this real historical country, Israel, was ruled by a historical puppet king named Herod that has been confirmed by other sources and archaeology. And this puppet king was actually ruled by an empire called Rome that we have lots of evidence for. His name was Caesar Augustus. And we have real and historical evidence that he had several censuses. So today, as we talk about Christmas, I want you to know I'm not talking about a story in a place far away a long time ago. I'm talking about an historical event, the first Christmas. I love what the famous radio and TV host Larry King said. You see, he was asked one time, if you could interview anyone in all of history, who would you interview? And Larry King responded, Jesus of Nazareth. And someone said, Larry, what would you ask him? And he says, Jesus, were you born divine? Because if Jesus was born divine, then it would change the course of human history. You see, Larry King knows what most legitimate historians and scholars know. Jesus existed and so did his disciples. And so as we talk about Christmas, we're talking about the Christmas event, the very first Christmas. Now here's the thing that there is one problem about the first Christmas that I have a problem with. And it's that the portrayal of the first Christmas is usually, it's not, it's unrealistic and it's unfair. And, and here's what I mean. I'm gonna kind of portray to you kind of what you usually see in the cartoons or the nativity scenes or in a Hallmark movie or on a Hallmark card, right? It's usually Mary and Joseph and they're a little bit older and they have smiles and they have all these nice clothes. They're duded up and they're usually in a wooden stable out on a plane. And this wooden stable looks like it was built by the Gaines from the Fixer Upper show. It's rustic and it's wood and it's awesome, right? And there's a star. And, and there's all these cute farm animals and they're neatly lined up in little rows, right? And not only they ni- nicely wrote, uh, lined up in little rows, right? There's baby Jesus in this beautifully uh, straw-filled um, manger, right? He's just, he's sitting there in that little trough, right? And, and then there's little animals all laying around and the, and the three magi or wise men are there and, and they usually have their gifts out in front of them. And we don't know if there were three, they just, we know they gave three gifts and, but it's usually three magi, but we don't know that, right? And then there are the shepherds there and they're all kneeling and it looks like this ah, picturesque moment. However, the very first Christmas was very different than that portrayal. Matter of fact, the very first Christmas well, it's full of craziness and stress, much like the season that you, the season that I, the season that we're in today. You see, the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew reveals that Christmas, the very first one, the historical one, well, it was anything but peaceful and like all put together. Matter of fact, we're going to pick it up in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew. It says this, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to stop us right there. Like, put it in modern day terms. Think about this. Think in a modern little town, like a little podunk town way out there, kind of in the middle of nowhere, where kind of everyone knows everyone, right? And there's Mary. She can't wait to be married. She finds her husband, Joseph. They're engaged, they're a fiance, and they're so excited about their wedding day. But all of a sudden, Mary ends up pregnant. And she's got to go tell her fiance, hey, I'm pregnant. I know you didn't do it because I'm a virgin, but it's God. I mean, think about what Joseph is saying. Joseph's like, God, mm mm-hmm. 
I'm pretty sure that neither Mary nor Joseph nor their family nor their community envisioned this is how it would go for them. Matter of fact, I know for sure that's not how Joseph imagined it because we see what he was thinking. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So think about it. They were in the middle of their wedding plans, and she becomes pregnant. The whispers began to start in her family and her friends. The whispers began to start in his family and his friends. And thankfully, through a dream, Joseph realizes that while this isn't what he expected, and this is crazier than he thought, and it was stressful, that this was really of God. But it's not over then. You see, there was a census taken. And so Mary and Joseph had to travel. Now, as a crow flies, it's about 60 miles. But Mary and Joseph had to travel over or roughly 90 miles on kind of this trek, right? Through the middle of winter in Israel to the city of Bethlehem to register for taxes. So you have to understand, Joseph actually comes from a royal descendant. He's actually a royal descendant of David. Life hasn't gone the way he thought it was going to be. His country has been conquered by a foreign army. His future wife is pregnant by God, right? And now he's got to take this long trek in the middle of winter where it rains and it's almost freezing temperatures at night. His wife is is mostly nine months pregnant by this time and they've got to travel all this to go register for taxes. Not very fun, not very easy as they have to do it. It costs them something. Oh, and when they get there, all the reservations through Airbnb, I'm just, I'm just joking, right? There, there was no reservations. So they were going from place to place to place. And finally, someone said, hey, listen, um, you can stay here. And this here, we're kind of told as, as Jesus was laid in a manger, it looks like that they were probably in kind of stable. But you have to understand, most stables in Bethlehem weren't these wooden stables outside. They were usually these caves in the rocks where they would put their animals. So most likely, after this long trek, where Mary has been pregnant, so they can come register to a foreign army to pay taxes that they don't want to pay. They can't only not stay with family, they're out in a cave, and that's where they're going to have their firstborn child in a cave, in a place they didn't want to be away from family and friends, and it's filled with barn animals. And then all of a sudden, some strange shepherds show up, and then after that happens, they have to go and dedicate their baby at the temple, only to discover that Herod the king wants to kill their baby. So not only did they have to travel um, to Bethlehem, now they can't go back to Nazareth. They have to flee the country, and they never end up back in their hometown. The first Christmas was crazy and it was stressful. Matter of fact, if you actually look at the account, the very first Christmas is this right here. The first Christmas was not a cakewalk. It was filled with craziness and stress. And I bet this is true of you and of me and of us this Christmas season. This year hasn't been a cakewalk, has it? It's been full of craziness and stress. But here's what's cool. Here's where we're going to get to the third thing that we can do other than try to manage the stress and other than medicate the craziness, right? The third thing, there's a thing. God showed up and God did the unimaginable. Matter of fact, we find this a little bit later, a few verses down in the eyewitness account of Matthew, Matthew 22 and 23. And it says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want you to stop and think about that for a second. Flawed people, a broken world, because we chose to rebel. And what does God do? God steps down from the glory of heaven and becomes a baby and lives among us and experiences the pain. God chooses to show up and step in and to be with you and I in this busted and broken mess so that he could fix what we couldn't. That God was with us. And God was with them through the very first Christmas. And so what I want to do in the midst of this crazy season, in the midst of the season where we may experience some extra stress, God did three specific things, or there's three specific things that happened at the first Christmas that God has been doing ever since then, and I believe God is still doing today in your life, in my life, and our life. And here's the first thing I want to remind us that we can kind of engage in, and it's this right here. God is present 
even when it doesn't feel like it. I'm sure that Mary and Joseph, as the gossiping was happening behind their back, I'm pretty sure they didn't feel like God was being present. When they did take that trek, that trek to uh, Bethlehem, when, when Mary was pregnant, I'm sure in the cold and in the journey and the aches and the pains and the cost of that trip, they probably were like, ah, oh, this isn't working well. This isn't going the way we hoped it. God, are you sure you're with us? Because this isn't working out so well. As they went from place to place and there was no place for them, I'm sure it didn't feel like God was present. I'm sure they didn't imagine having their firstborn son in a cave. It probably didn't feel like it, but God was present. When they had to flee their country and not be able to go back home, I'm sure it probably felt like God wasn't there, but God was present. And here's what we can learn from the very first Christmas. Just because it doesn't feel like God is there doesn't mean that he isn't. Just because sometimes circumstances are busted or broken or we experience the ups and downs of life doesn't mean that God isn't present. God absolutely showed up in all of those things. God protected them from robbers on that journey. Even though they didn't get to stay in the place that they thought they were going to stay in, God did provide a place for Jesus to be born. God provided people. Yeah, you know what? God provided an angel to Mary and a dream to Joseph. But you know what? God showed up in their life and through people. I mean, think about it. When they were in that little cave, God sent shepherds who reminded them that Jesus was the Messiah and this would be worth it. When they had to take baby Jesus to the temple and, and, and dedicate him, right? There was Simon and Anna who God used to say, yes, he's the Messiah and to encourage them. When they had to leave the country and they didn't have resources, God sent the Magi and who gave them kingly gifts, priceless -like gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They were able to have resources. And even though they didn't feel like it, God was present in each of those things. Even when it doesn't feel like it, God is present. You know, I was thinking about this and looking back in my own story. <clears throat> I've had times in my life where things have gone well. And I've had times in my life where things haven't gone well. And the reality is, is even in my darkest moments, when I was one of the youngest kids to be incarcerated in a juvenile detention center, God sent a person, his name was Marvin Jones, and he shared that God loved me and that I wasn't the sum of my failures. A little bit later, when I was homeless, God sent my adopted mom and dad into my life to give me a place. He used people. Later, when my wife and I had a miscarriage and we were sad and heartbroken, God sent a friend to sit with us in the hospital. It's amazing that even though life doesn't always work the way it's supposed to, God will show up and be present in people. And I wonder, this December, has God put some people in your life? Maybe you were scrolling through Facebook or YouTube and you stop and maybe God's using me to let you know that you are loved and you are valuable. Maybe for you it's a family member that God has made present to share that you matter deeply to him. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a neighbor. I bet if we're all really honest, we can look back at a season and go, it didn't feel like it, but God was present. God was trying to reach me. God was trying to care for me. Which leads me to observation number two, which is this. God makes a way even then when it's different than what we wanted. I mean, think about it. I'm pretty sure Mary and Joseph didn't want all the things going on about them. We know that later in Jesus' life, he was called the illegitimate child. So there must have been rumor after rumor. I'm sure that's not what... Mary and Joseph plan. I'm sure their firstborn, I'm sure they had a decorated room and kind of like a nursery infant place. They didn't expect it to be in a cave. They expected to be able to raise their firstborn son around family, but they had to be outside the country for a season. I'm sure that in all those things, God made a way even when it was different than what they wanted. I mean, think about what God did. God provided protection, right? I mean, Mary, when she went to go tell Joseph that she was pregnant and it was God, she was probably like, God, like, you know, like, I'm a part of this. And like, I said yes, but like, like, how does this work? What do you do? So God provided for Mary a dream to Joseph so that he would marry her. God provided protection on the trip. God provided resources so that they could move. God made a way throughout their whole life that even when it was different than what they expected, that God made a way practically for them. 
it makes me think about, can you think of a time where you didn't know how you were gonna do it, but God made a way? True story, uh, my wife and I, we uh, moved here to St. Mary's. We were working for a nonprofit organization and uh, we, we didn't make a lot of money at the time. And we had this incident that happened in our family. It wasn't my fault, it wasn't my wife's fault. Um, and we tried to fix this situation and we did, we did all the right things. Like we did the right thing, you know, each step of the way. And each step of the way, we ran into a circumstance that just kind of just kept kicking us down. And it was stressful and it was crazy. It was kind of like the chaos of life stepping into our life. But I can tell you that just randomly, out of the blue, someone did something nice for us that stepped in and God made a way. Now, it looked different than what I thought or what I had wanted, but God made a way. I get it. All of us have a dream of what we want our life to look like. And maybe this year, we thought we wanted to look this way and it's absolutely looked different. And I want you to hear the same way that God made a way for Mary and Joseph, God will make a way for you. God will make a way for your children. God will make a way for your family. Not because you earned it or worked for it, but because God loves you. Which leads me to the third point is this. God turns pain into purpose. Whenever I talk to people about pain, I always go, pain is above my pay grade. Like I know a couple of truths. God is good and he is loving. I know human beings have choice because love requires choice. For true love to be love, you have to be able to choose. And when there's the ability to choose, there's the ability to do evil and wrong and create brokenness that breaks God's heart. So I don't understand all that there is about pain. But what I do know is that God can turn pain into purpose. I mean, think about Mary and Joseph. They had some real legitimate pain. And in the moment when people were whispering, in the moment when their son was born in a place that they didn't want him to be born in, as they had to leave their home country to hide so that their child wouldn't be killed. That was a real and legitimate pain. And what they couldn't see in that moment is that God had a purpose. I mean, think about it. Caesar Augustus was the emperor of the known world at the time, and he is yet a footnote in the birth story of Jesus. Who do we talk about? Mary and Joseph and their faithfulness. We think about King Herod, who was known for being a great architect and a great politician at his time, and he was lauded as a great puppet king for his nation. Yet he's a footnote in the birth story of Jesus. Yet this Mary and Joseph, who experienced real and legitimate pain, and they couldn't see it, their story has impacted eternity. Their story has impacted your life and my life and the life of people since then. The reality is, is that God can turn our pain in to purpose. As I think about my own life, I can think of lots of pain points. My mom committed suicide. I was sent to a counselor who was a child molester. My dad took me to the police station when I was 12 and a half. I got sick and was sick for a couple of years and couldn't figure it out. My wife and I had a miscarriage. And I could tell you a bunch of other things that have gone wrong in my life where I've experienced real pain. But here's what I can tell you is through all that pain, it has allowed me the opportunity to help other people who've experienced pain. And I believe God can turn. I don't think he wants pain. I think pain breaks the heart of God. If you have children, pain does not make you happy for your kids. It breaks your heart. But God takes what is meant for evil or for broken, and he can turn it for good. God can turn pain into purpose. And so you might be saying, well, if we can't manage the stress and the chaos of the Christmas season and medicating the stress and the craziness of the Christmas season, isn't it? What are we supposed to do? Well, there's the third option. We can marvel at a wondrous truth. And it's kind of the whole point of the message if I was gonna tie it up in a bow would be this. The wondrous truth of the Christmas is this. We can marvel in this truth is the craziness of life can't take away God's love or purpose. You see, the craziness and the stress of life doesn't define you or it doesn't define me and it doesn't define we. You see, the wondrous truth of Christmas is that God loves you and that he has a purpose for you and there is no circumstance that can take that away from you and I. That God is present in the bustedness and the craziness. That God will make a way in the craziness and the bustedness. And no matter how busted or broken, God can fulfill a purpose in your life. You are designed for a reason to be in a relationship with him. You have a destiny. The truth is, this wondrous truth is, we don't have to work for it or earn it. 
we can just marvel at this love and this purpose that God gives you, gives me. It allows Christmas to celebrate the rest, not create stress. I want to close with a true story. You know, craziness and stress, it happens to us all. I was thinking about a time, I was about 17 years old, I'd gotten out of juvie and been sent to a foster home. And I lived in that foster home for about maybe six months. And one weekend, uh, my foster parents, they took me out to dinner. It was a nice steak dinner. I was like, man, this is pretty cool. I'm glad they're, I'm glad they're chilling with me and like, giving me this nice steak dinner. But at that dinner, I got kind of surprised. They're like, hey, um, we thought we wanted to be foster parents. We don't. We're moving out of our house this weekend. You need to find a place to live by Monday. I'm like, it's Friday night. And they're like, yeah, I know. And I was like, man, what do I do? So the next morning, I called my probation officer and said, hey, listen, my foster parents, like they said they don't wanna do this. I don't have a place to live. And here's my probation officer's response. He goes, listen, you've got only a couple more months, maybe four or five more months until you're 18, right? And he says, I tell you this, you don't have to take another P test if you find a place to live until you're 18. And I was a knucklehead at that time, so I said, deal. But now I was homeless. The chaos and craziness and stress of the world happened to me. And just like at the first Christmas, even though I couldn't see it, even though I couldn't feel it, and even if it was different than what I imagined, God was present. He ended up putting this couple into my life from a church that was a lot like South Point. They were the youth pastors and I asked them if I could have a place to crash and they said yes. And eventually they became my adopted mom and dad. And man, that was a ride. I was a knucklehead. It wasn't easy. They're, like I didn't change overnight and it's a story. But man, in that moment where it was crazy and stressful, God was still present and real and he fulfilled his purpose. And I didn't have to earn it or work for it. He did it because he loves us. So today I wanna give you a challenge as you're looking at this Christmas season going, listen, I'm already weary. How do I find rest in this upcoming season that, well, there's added stress and craziness? And it's this, to celebrate this rest that we can find in God's amazing grace and love. So I wanna give you three specific challenges to maybe uh, do over the next week. For some of you, this will be so easy. Just maybe at dinner time, maybe as you go to bed, just stop. And what I want you to do is look back at your day and go, is there anywhere that maybe God was present that I just missed him? Is there anything that I can be grateful for that I go, oh, like there was a person, there was a thing. Like, can you just take a second to look and go, maybe you don't have faith in God yet. Maybe you're still kind of exploring this thing, but maybe you could take a look back and journal or talk about it at your table and go, what's one thing where maybe God was present in my day? Here's the second thing, is just to listen. Is it possible that God might be trying to speak to you? Maybe he's using this message to let you know that you matter deeply to him, that you are loved, and it's not your circumstances or your, or your choices, it's the cross that defines how much you matter to God, right? Maybe it's me you need to listen to, maybe there's a spouse, maybe there's a family member, it could be a coworker, it could be a neighbor that God has used to speak into your life. Maybe this week you just need to listen, maybe you just go, instead of like writing something down or thinking about one thing to be thankful for, you're just gonna go, I'm gonna slow down and I'm just gonna listen extra careful and go, maybe God is trying to speak into my life. For some of us, it's been a really hard year. You're weary and tired. And maybe what you can do is just trust, like Mary and Joseph, to just trust God that in the midst of the craziness, in the midst of the stress, you're gonna do the next right thing. You're not gonna over-medicate your life. You're not gonna try to over-manage it and control people, right? You're not gonna consume or control. You're gonna choose to trust Christ and you're gonna just do the next right thing in the middle of this season. Because even though you can't see, God does have purpose. So maybe as we kick off the Christmas season, we can rest and that there's a God who is with us and who is for us and who will accomplish his purpose, not because we're good enough or because we earned it, but because he loves us. Let me pray for us. Hey God, thank you. Thank you that in this season where it has been stressful and it is crazy and we are weary, that we don't have to try to control, we don't have to try to contribute. God, that you stepped in. 
God, and we can trust you, God, that your love is, is free and that you are with us in the midst of this, God, that we can look for you, that you are speaking and that you will make a way and that you have purpose, God. God, let us take joy and peace in knowing that you love us and are for us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. And never forget, you matter deeply to God.